What up, what up, what up? It's Kilo, and we are back for another episode of the regular podcast on the regular network. It's real. It's good, my people. How y'all feeling? How y'all feeling? We, we here for another good week of this podcast thing, this thing that we call the regular podcast. I'm going to just let y'all know right now. I have no idea why I'm recording this podcast so late. You know, for y'all, y'all are watching it whenever y'all are watching it. I'm just starting the recording, and it's midnight for me right now. Last two last two nights, I've been working late. I slept on the basement couch the last couple of nights because it was so late. I didn't even feel like walking upstairs. I just passed out right in my movie room behind this wall right here. So, you know, I'm running on straight water and Twizzlers. I can't even say I'm running on fumes. I don't have no fumes left. Water and Twizzlers is what's keeping me going right now. So, you know, just got out the shower. That's why I'm dressed like this. I don't even care right now. We we just going we gonna to do it. I got my my girl dad shirt on. Come on, man. I got my, my OG sh- pants on, my Triple M hat on. I'm bumming it right now, but I'm clean and I smell good. So that's really what I care about. Make sure you like this video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you turn on the notification bell. Make sure you uh, comment your thoughts below. Make sure you share the video on your social media platforms. Also, make sure you share it to your friends. Let them know, hey, some good info going on on this channel right here. Excuse me. Uh, so we got a few topics to get into. I'm going to try not to make this episode too long because, like I said, I'm tired. So I'm going to give... The, all the energy that I have, I'm going to put it into this episode and I edit this thing up tomorrow, whatever, do my thing and, and y'all will see it when y'all see it. So Pete, the YSL update is going to be very short this week because they only had pretty much one day of a trial and then they went on break for, the, for you know, they went a little spring break. So, you know, of course, Adrian Bean is on the stand still. And uh, it was time for cross-examination. So Brian still went up there on cross-examination. And uh, I'm not going to lie, I did not expect it to be that hostile. Am I the only one who was a little bit shocked at how hostile Brian still was being? And uh, uh, Adrian Bean was kind of pushing back too. He was like pretty much on some, why you keep asking me the same thing? I answered that already. Adrian Bean was giving it up like that. Brian still was giving it up like, why you keep lying about not forgetting stuff? I mean, about forgetting stuff. This, you know, you remember it. I don't get why you lying. Like Bryce, they was getting at each other. I don't know what in the world. I felt like when Adrian Bean was being direct examined from the prosecution, and I don't even know this, if that's how you say it, direct examined, but on direct examination, Adrian Bean didn't give the prosecution, I don't think, anything that they could use to help. He didn't help the defense, but I don't think he helped the prosecution either. He just didn't answer nothing. So I didn't expect uh, Brian Steele to go so hard like that. And what Brian Steele seems to me like he was doing is, all right, so the the entire time is I'm about to impeach. I just want to impeach him. I want to let it be known he's a liar. He's lying. He's saying he don't remember nothing. And that's not true. So he's lying, I'm guessing, so that when that jail call gets played, and shout out to, to the person that commented on last week's video and said that that jail call will be played and it will be played when they in, or when they when Detective Quinn testifies. And at first, before Monday, I didn't agree with that. But then when I listened to Brian Steele's cross examination of Adrian Bean, I agree. So shout out to y'all. And that's why I say if I say something wrong or if I say something that you disagree with or if you think my prediction is incorrect, put it in the comments because I'm for sure reading it. If you're right, you're right. I, what can I say? So I, I think that person that commented was correct. They are going to use the phone call from the jail phone call when when Detective Quinn comes up. So I'm guessing Brian Steele is going this hard to make this guy look like a liar so that they when they play that jail call, they can say, this dude is lying. He's clearly lying. He's lying so much that even after he said what he said on the jail call, they never charged Young Thug or Jeffrey Williams with this. If y'all had, if y'all so so uh, so called had one of the suspects telling you that somebody else did it, if that was truthful, y'all would have charged him way back then in 2015 when this case got handled. But y'all didn't, and now y'all are trying to come in 2024 
and make it seem like he was involved in this shooting case. I saw another comment that said that at the time that all this was happening, I guess back in 2013 when Young Thug was like on the come up or whatever, he was saying, the comment was saying that it was kind of a known thing and it kind of helped boost Young Thug's name up that he was involved in a police shooting. So that's what, like, that's what somebody who commented said. I'm, I'm not familiar with that. I was uh, in Virginia when this was going on, so I wasn't familiar with this. I don't even think I knew who Young Thug was. I knew some of his songs, but I didn't know who he was yet. I knew the music, not him. So Brian Steele is definitely going hard to say, like, he's impeaching. Also, not only was it just one day, it wasn't even a full day of trial. They, they pretty much went from, like, 11 o'clock to like 1.30 or something like that. It might not even have been that long, but it didn't last long at all that, that day. So it's a very short recap, and then that'll be it on that. But so, yeah, Brian still is, is – he even asked um, Adrian Bean, and this was crazy to me because of the way Adrian Bean responded. He asked Adrian Bean, do you want to go back to jail or do you want to go back to prison? I cannot. I'm asking. What do you mean, so do I want to go back to prison? You don't want to go back to prison, do you? If I had to go, I would. I went to prison. Do you want to I'd go back? Been, I'd have been to prison before. And Adrian Bean said, I will if I have to. So pretty much, Brian Steele asked him multiple times, do he want to go back to prison? And he was, and Adrian Bean was just confused by the question. He's just like, what, pretty much, why are you asking me that? Like, I don't, I don't even know what you mean by that. That's pretty much what he kept saying. Like, I don't know what you mean. Then eventually, as Brian Steele asked the question, do you want to go back to prison? He was like, I will if I have to. That was so strange to me because... I mean, I guess it's not strange because he's a former street dude and he's just trying to say, like, y'all not going to be able to intimidate me with jail. Pretty much. I've been to prison before. It don't, It is what it is. That's that's pretty much how he was answering the question. Like, it is what it is. If y'all going to send me to prison, then, then do what you got to do because I'm still going to answer these questions the way I'm answering them. That's how he was on it. So I'm like, Brian still was going at him, but he was going right back. So I don't know what this was. Like I said, this is just more... Um, entertainment like for the circus and it's not necessarily just entertainment because people's lives are on the line here their freedom is on the line but the way this case is going it looks like they're just trying to set it up for some tv show or movie to come that's how outlandish some of the stuff is that's going on in this courtroom so let me look at my notes see if there was anything else i wanted to talk touch on about this let me see. oh okay so now the key the key to brian Steele now just like when Adrian Bean was being examined by the prosecution, he was saying, I don't know, I don't recall, I don't remember that. He was doing that same thing to Brian Steele. Until Brian Steele brought up, so when I met up with you last year to do to investigate this trial here, because you were a witness, when I met up with you to interview you in January of 2023, you walked this whole thing through with me. You told me everything about this situation. Do you remember that conversation? Of course, Adrian Bean says, I don't remember that. I don't know what I, I don't remember none of the stuff I said to you. So Brian still, of course, he's frustrated. He's asking him more and more questions. He's like, I don't recall that. Ask him more questions. I don't recall that. Doing the same thing that he did to Adrian Love. They both you maybe they had an Adrian connection. Adrian Bean and Adrian Love. But anyway, so as he's doing that, then he said, So do you, are you telling me that? You didn't tell me that young th- that that the police were targeting young thug because he was he was had a lot of money and he would be a big catch. And that's when Adrian Bean cracked. He said. No, wait, wait, I, there was something else actually before this. There was something else before this where he said, I didn't say that. I'm, I can't remember it. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go back and grab a clip and try to put it in here if I can remember. But Brian Steele said something, right? And maybe it was incorrect. Or I don't know if Brian Steele said it wrong on purpose or what. But Adrian B said, I didn't say that. Do you remember then explaining that they, meaning the detectives, tried to force Jeffrey Williams or Young Thug into it? Remember saying that? I think that was something you said, right? No. I know. I don't remember that. So that right there, I think that was what um, Adrian Love, attorney Adrian Love, was trying to get Adrian Bean to do. 
was correct something that was wrong. I think he was trying to get that to happen, but he never cracked. But with Brian Steele, he cracked. He said, I didn't say that. Right? So then they keep on going with the question. They keep on going. And then he's like, then Brian Steele asked him, so you didn't tell me that the police were out to get Young Thug because they had a lot of money and they made you, you know, he was like a big fish to them, right? And he was like, Adrian Bean says, I might have said something like that. So now we're getting somewhere. Do you remember on Sunday, approximately 11, 11 to 11.22 at Kroger's near your home, stating on recording to Investigator Martin and me that the street wants... Everybody wants to go against the man, young thug. He's got money. Remember that? I may have said that. One more time. I may have said something like that. Do you remember explaining that all you know is that thug is in the studio? I may have said something like that. I don't remember that one still. Do you also remember giving your opinion that Derek Dotson killed himself? This is a 10-year-old matter, and this should be over with. You remember saying that? Something like that. And when when this happened, what I'm what I'm describing right now, when that happened, that was towards the end of the day, pretty much. So that kind of stopped things because Adrian uh, Attorney Love, the prosecutor, kind of got up like, you know, it was a little bit of commotion right then because now Adrian Bean remembers things. You understand? And um. And what's the name is about to get some answers. So we was like, it was towards the end of the day or whatever like that. So it wasn't too much more cross-examination after that, but it's going to continue when they come back from their break on March 13th. But um, Brian Steele straight up said to him, uh, you're, you're lying. Like, why are you, why are you lying here? Or you are lying. He just told him you're lying. Right. And I was confused about why, an attorney is allowed to say that to a, somebody that's testifying to straight up tell them you're lying. I wonder what that's about. That's like, what what does badger and a witness mean? I thought that badger and a witness would, would be something like that. But what does it mean then if, if that's not it? If you as an attorney is straight up telling the person that's testifying that they're lying, which maybe they are lying, but the fact that you're telling them they're lying and not leaving it up to the jury to determine whether or not they're lying, I would I would assume that that's should fall in line of what, you know, badger and witness, or I don't know. Maybe I don't know what badger and witness mean. I just thought that something like that would fall in line with that. I don't know, but y'all let me know what y'all think about that because um, now this is, that we, we are really coming up on a month of them dealing with this one incident. Do y'all realize that? I think, I think this week right here was the third week of it, right? I think so. So, this is the third week, and then in two weeks they come back and do some more. And it's not it's not a full month of court time, but it's a full month of actual time dealing with this one incident. Which now this is where I say the prosecution is, I think, hurting themselves when they do stuff like this. Because if if they were just prosecuting this case alone, like back in 2015 when they were starting to prosecute Adrian Bean, Walter Murphy, and the other person, Frederick, whatever his name was, Frederick Prothro. When they were start, when they were prosecuting this case back then, had they taken it to trial, this would have been a one or two day trial, right? Maybe maybe three day because there was a police shooting involved and there was a lot going on. So why are you taking a month to pro- to to now prosecute something while it's in this case that you would have taken a day or two to prosecute if it was a standalone? It's like they're prolonging things purposely to anger somebody. I don't know who they're trying to anger. I don't know if they're trying to like drag out and maybe hope that young thug runs out of money or something or I don't know what I don't know what the angle is here for them to be dragging this case out like this but I don't see it going favorably for them when it comes to the jury and how the jury is going to be viewing them because a lot of these seemingly frivolous people that are coming up there to testify are being brought by the state you know what I'm saying so I and the jury knows that the jury knows this is a state's witness they subpoenaed 400 people or you know so I think that I don't I don't think they're helping themselves when they do this. You know, I don't think they're helping themselves when they do this at all. So we'll see how the jury feels about this, man. And actually, this will be the shortest YSL trial recap that I've done since the trial started, because, like I said, it was only one day of court this week. Now, in the bigger 
thing that's been going on right now, especially I live in Atlanta. So the biggest thing going on right now is this Fonnie Willis, Nathan Wade, Ashley Merchant, Donald Trump, Michael Roman, this whole thing that's going on right now in Fulton County in the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. Man, listen, this year just started, right? Ashley Merchant filed this motion to disqualify Nathan Wade as a special prosecutor and Fonnie Willis for conflict of interest. She filed it on January 8th. So this thing, so they are kicking off 2024, a presidential election year, very, very, very hot and heavy, right? You got, you got presidents being indicted. You got misappropriation of funds alleged. You got relationships, affairs, people cheating on wives. You got, you know, you got all type of stuff going on. And this is just the beginning of the year. So just imagine how much crazier things are going to get as these as this trial progresses, as this case progresses, as more information comes out. <clears throat> so the reason I'm bringing this up, because I talked about it last week when they when they wrapped up the argument for the disqualification hearing. What ended up happening is the Senate, the Georgia State Senate, they have a committee. Um, What is it called? Let me see. The Committee of Investigations. They subpoenaed Ashley Merchant. They said, you need to bring your here and come explain everything that's going on. Explain it to us. And I guess this committee is put in place because, all right, so if, we, if there's some wild information going on with people that are in government, we want to know about it because we might want to open up an investigation on it. So that's what they did. They brought in Ashley Merchant so that she could testify. It's not like she was in trouble or anything, but they were pretty much brought her in so that they can question her, ask her everything they wanted to ask her, get her to turn over some documents to them. And they would go through them and start their investigation and see if, you know, what needs to happen. Essentially, what the what the chairperson was saying is that they want to see if, you know, any any wrongdoing is actually going on crimes, I guess, by these people in, in power or they want to see if they need to probably tighten up the statutes and or rewrite some statutes to cover things that might not be covered currently. Right. Things that might not be covered currently that are making it so that this case is very fishy because maybe it's not something maybe they haven't done anything against the law, but they're doing things that seem wrong, morally, ethically, whatever the case is. So, you know, this committee, supposedly, that's what that's what they're job is. So we're going to investigate, find out. And if anything is out of place, we might make some changes to some rules or we might, you know, so they get her in there and they pretty much make their, their immortalizing Ashley Merchant as now the authority on how the authority on what is proper for in special prosecution situations or what is proper in terms of district attorney relationships or what is proper in terms of how much uh, what's the standard on gift giving and all this type. They're pretty much making her the authority on it because they're asking her about it. They're not going to their rules and their guidelines and policies and laws and statutes and saying, what's the rule on this? They're going to her and asking her, explain this to us. Tell us how this is wrong. Tell us how this is a conflict of interest. Tell us what they were doing how much money was moving around, where they went. Oh, they, they they went to Ashley Merchant and had her come talk about it, which makes it even crazier what I said about that whole, about the sexism thing. And last week's uh, closing argument for the disqualification hearing, that lady is not sick. She's of sound mind. Somebody just made the call to say she shouldn't close out her own argument. The Senate committee, they saw what I saw. That's the lady that we need to be talking to. That's the lady that has all the information. That's the lady that cracked this whole thing off. And she's the one that got all the information from the inside. Okay. So we don't want to talk to anybody else but her. They didn't call a single other lawyer up there. Just her, not even her husband. And her husband was with her and he was involved in the hearing. They called her only. So they saw the same thing I saw. Like, um, so they get her in there. They ask her all these questions. And there was there was a lot of questions. Let's let's uh, let me see if I have. Let's see what we have here, man. It is it is not looking good. I'm not going to lie to you. Before I was saying that before I was saying that Fonnie Willis will be fine because this disqualification thing will more so it'll impact Nathan Wade more than it will impact Fonnie. That's what I was saying before. It'll impact Nathan Wade before more than it will impact Fonnie Willis because 
being disqualified for finding Willis just means, okay, cool. I'll just go back and handle all my other cases in my office. I just won't be able to prosecute Donald Trump in the Fulton County District Attorney Office. That would that would have been the extent for her. But for Nathan Wade, as a person who's lying in his divorce proceedings, as a person who's lying in this proceeding, as a person who's having all these issues, he would be lined up to be in some actual trouble, right? But now, looking at this Senate hearing, they are probably about to open up an investigation into Fannie Willis's financial dealings because the reason that she Fannie Willis was able to decline motions to to receive her her bank statements and all that is because she's not actually in trouble. She's not on trial, so she she doesn't have really anything to do with what's going. I mean, she appointed Nathan Wade, but she's not the one in trouble or in question here. Nathan Wade is. That's why he turned over his stuff. She's not in trouble, so she doesn't have to give them anything, right? But now, if they charge her with a crime for whatever is going on, or let's say they start investigating her and say, you're under investigation, you need to turn over this stuff. You know, they subpoena it or whatever like that, and she can't block it because she's an elected official, and now it's time for you to open up them books. Now, we're going to start running into some issues. So, let's see here. What, 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 so, now, yes, yeah, she's, she's in trouble now. Like it's not, it's no longer just a Fulton County thing. Now the state of Georgia is involved. The state of Georgia, people who look at, um, I guess, political impropriety, they're involved now, right? So let's let's go down my list. What are we looking at here? So they're pretty much asking Ashley Merchant, like, what do you see? Like, what patterns do you see? What habits? What were they doing? How do you know? Where did this information come from? When did it, when did it start? Who's the who's the mole? Who's the snitch? You know, who's the whistleblower, whatever, all that. And so she's just telling them, you know, pretty much Bradley. Bradley was the mole. Right. So this is one thing I found out. Bradley was the mole. But Bradley was originally anonymous. See, I didn't realize that he was originally anonymous. He had given Ashley Merchant all that information. And when she filed the motion, she left out. She left out parts of it that were specific to that, that Nathan Wade knew he was the only one to do, right? She left it out so that he wouldn't be able to be identified. And then as Fonnie Willis and her office are filing what they call motions to quash, which means they want to like throw this evidence out or throw out, throw out these subpoenas and all this type of stuff. When they were filing those, I guess they said pretty, I, I didn't watch the motions to quash hearings. I'm assuming they said like, we need to be able to face our accusers. So whoever is putting this, whoever gave you this information, we need to be able to uh, face them and they need to testify. So whatever the situation happened is that, because I didn't see it, um, the judge said that Ashley Merchant, you have to tell them who gave you this information. And that's when Bradley's uh, got exposed as the as the mole, pretty much. And Ashley Merchant said pretty much from that point forward, she said before he got exposed, he, they were talking all the time. She, he was giving up all the information all the time. But after the exposure, cut her off. He never. He didn't talk to her again. He didn't give her any more information after that. So uh, pretty much now I got to jump around because what I, what I just said is related to this other part that happened later in the hearing. So at, at, and a couple hours into this whole hearing thing, the Senate hearing, they asked. Uh, so Ashley Merchant started to talk to them, talk to the Senate about how Bradley, Terrence Bradley, started to get phone calls from Nathan Wade's side. And it wasn't from Nathan Wade directly, but it was from that side of things. Calling him, pretty much questioning him like, hey, are you the mole? Did you did you uh, give all this information up? Like, are you the one that snitched on us and all that? And Nathan uh, and, and, and Terrence Bradley was feeling like this is, they're trying to intimidate me. Pretty much, they put they they call in the guard dogs on me. They trying to intimidate me. Now, the person who called and did all that, his name is Gabe Banks, right? I think I mentioned him in a previous video. Gabe Banks is a very close friend of Nathan Wade. Also, Gabe Banks's wife works for Fonnie Willis, right? So you can see how they pressured Gabe Banks or told Gabe Banks, "Hey, call call him up because we can't call him because that's witness tampering. We can't call him, so you got to call him." whole time it's still witness tampering if you send somebody else to do it right so then after that i guess bradley is irritated he's annoyed or whatever he calls up ashley merchant and say hey can you believe they just had gabe call me and, and tell me pretty much whatever whatever so i guess they were upset together as they sat on the phone and, and talked about everything 
Then the next day after that, they say that, let me see what they say. They said the next day after that, Nathan Wade himself called Terrence Bradley's best friend and told, now this is allegedly, I don't know. This is what Ashley Merchant said. Nathan Wade called Terrence Bradley's best friend and said, yo, make sure you remind him he better not say nothing because attorney client privilege. He can't say anything about me. He can't say anything I ever told him. He can't. Attorney client privilege is a wrap. He better not talk. And remember, we talked about that attorney client privilege thing. So now we know where that threat came from. It came from Nathan Wade and him telling him, yo, attorney client privilege, you better not say nothing up in there. Whole time, the judge went and found out like, y'all don't have attorney client privilege here. So he made him talk and it, and it got it got ugly for him. But so. Now it's now so I know some people might be thinking like why was why was Bradley just telling all of Nathan Wade's information business like that? Originally, I thought it was because they had fallen out from from the business thing. Excuse me, and Terrence Bradley was like mad at Wade for kicking him out the business for the whole sexual assault stuff, right? But according to Ashley Merchant, <laughs> according to Ashley Merchant, Terrence Bradley was actually mad at Nathan Wade. Because of how Nathan Wade was treating his own wife, treating his wife, cheating on her with Fonnie Willis, spending their money on Fonnie Willis and vacations, hiding money from her. I guess Terrence Bradley was like the the moral police in that situation. And he and he pretty much didn't like it. So I guess he was standing up for Nathan Wade's wife somehow and said, hey, we're going we're going to take him down. And by taking him down, we're going to give all the information to Ashley Merchant. And uh, hopefully that helps. Now, I'm going to say this, right? Terrence Bradley, my boy, you um, you got creep energy all on you, man. Like a lot of a lot of this is not possible without any of that information that you gave that woman. You understand? And I'm, I'm not saying that people who do wrong shouldn't be exposed or whatever. I'm saying that's your friend. If them people is going to do some investigation, if those people are going to figure out something to take down one of your friends, even if y'all don't talk all the time anymore, or even if y'all don't talk at all anymore. If those people are going to investigate and take down somebody that you had a business with, somebody that you've been friends with for years, let them do it on their own. I'm not saying stand in the way. I'm not saying obstruction of justice, none of that type of stuff. I'm saying let them handle it on their own. Make them go find the information without you. You didn't have to tell Ashley Merchant anything about that relationship. And this is why I say you kind of creeped out, right? My boy, Mr. Bradley. First of all, you do that, right? So you you, you betray your, your one of your close friends. And you knew you were wrong because you wanted it to remain hidden. It wasn't like you were trying to betray him publicly because, you know, he, you felt like he really did you wrong. You were trying to hide yourself. You told Ashley Merchant to put your own financial stuff in that motion so it wouldn't look like you were being left out because that would make it suspicious for you. So you were really deliberately trying to hide yourself. You weren't so you weren't. It, this wasn't you getting back at him. You were trying to do some snake stuff. I'm talking to Terrence Bradley right now. Attorney Terrence Bradley. You were trying to do some snake stuff to somebody that was your friend. Right. So. You have an employee at. Your law firm when you had the uh, law firm with Campbell, Wade and Bradley that you allegedly sexually assaulted that young lady. Right. That's creep move. Number one. You had a client. The client means this person is paying you for your services, legal services. Allegedly, again, you sexually assault your client. I'm assuming that you're not married. You have major problems with how Nathan Wade's wife is being treated. So you decide, I want to snake him for his wife. Creep move number three. And then telling Ashley Merchant all his business makes me feel like you wanted her to. That's creep move number four. You got four strikes, my boy. You're out of here. This is, and, and now, of course, what I'm talking about right now is not legal jargon. I'm talking about how we view our, our, our fellow bros that do things like what Terrence Bradley is accused of doing. Now, I know none of this, what we're talking about is about Terrence Bradley's character. However, he is the biggest. So what I've been saying, Ashley Merchant is the key to all this is because 
she had Terrence Bradley feeding her all this information. Without this information, none of the rest of this is possible. Now, that's not to say Fonnie Willis is not wrong. That's not to say Nathan Wade is not wrong. Last week, I told y'all, I didn't think Nathan Wade should have been picked. There, I, I, and I, this is what, my, what we're saying here, right? What I'm saying here. People are trying to make this about, yo, they're trying to attack black people. They're trying to do the black thing. Do you know how many, do you know how many district attorneys work in a, I mean, do you know how many attorneys, prosecutors work in a district attorney's office that are black that Fonnie Willis did not choose? <laughs> do you realize that? Now, there's some more stuff that came out in this hearing, right? Fonnie Willis made a request to the Fulton County Commission Commission to get more funding so that she could prosecute a bunch of backlog worth of cases, millions of dollars worth of cases. So she needed million, excuse me, millions of dollars, right? They granted her five million dollars. And with that five million dollars, she was supposed to hire a bunch of lawyers so that they could prosecute more cases. They had a bunch of cases backlogged, right? So pretty much what she did was and what they're saying and alleging and then is that she pretty much used the money that she got for, for um, to hire people to do backlogs. She used it and paid Nathan Wade so that he could prosecute Donald Trump. A new case. So, th- this is all bad. Ashley Merchant was able to get records of what she was asking for. And one thing she couldn't get, though, because Fulton County refused... She tried to get a copy uh, or some proof as to what that money was used on and how many people got hired, how many full time prosecutors got hired with the money that she requested from the county. She wasn't able to get it. However, if they open up an investigation against Fonnie Willis in the Fulton County, uh, Fulton County District Attorney's Office, they will be able to get that information. But because Fonnie, uh, because Ashley Merchant does not work for the state, she's not a you know, she's not on the law enforcement or she's not on the criminal justice side of things. She's a defense lawyer. She can't just get certain documents that the law side could get. So, you know what they what they what they found what we found out here? Nathan Wade has never in his career prosecuted a felony case. Let me say it again. Nathan Wade at no point in his career at no point in his career has prosecuted a felony case. So when we're talking about something being about race and them attacking them because they're black, why didn't Fonnie Willis choose one of the black attorneys that works in her office that handles stuff like this? The Fulton County District Attorney's Office has their own they, they have a whole division for corruption cases, just like this. They have a division full of prosecutors that handle cases just like this. They also have experts on RICO cases in that office. They hired none of them. They hired the man that she just happened to be dealing with that has never handled a felony case in his life. We got to we got to figure this out. We don't have to like this to me. This is on a grand scheme, right? I mean, this is on a much grander scale than what I'm about to my example I'm about to use. But this to me feels like the Shakari Richardson situation. Remember a few years ago for the Olympics, Shakari Richardson like threw herself out of contention because she smoked weed, got high, failed a drug test. And somehow like people was making it seem like she was just being attacked because she was black. Like you just failed a drug test. Like it's not like a. It's, it's not a, you know, I love the race card. You know what I mean? Like if you look at my wallet and you look at the cards, I have a race card in there. You know what I'm saying? I love, the, I love to use the race card. But some stuff is, is just laying there right on the table for us to just say, we actually can just take accountability for that. Is that we don't even have to look nowhere else. In this instance, Fonnie Willis just has to take accountability for making a terrible decision. It makes no sense. There's nowhere where you can point to at any point in the decision making process that was involved in her choosing Nathan Wade as a special prosecutor to prosecute one of the most complex cases in the history of this state. Choose a man who has never prosecuted a felony. 
There's no point in that decision making process that you are going to be able to tell me that makes sense. There's no way. No way. Fulton, her office has a corruption division. Her office has RICO experts. But she hired outside special prosecutor. Bad decision making. Terrible decision making, man. And now look at the situation we are in. I honestly don't think that Fonnie Willis knew that Nathan Wade was doing uh, foolishness with that money. I don't think she knew that he was hiding money in different accounts and not paying himself properly and hiding money from his wife. I don't think she knew that. I don't think she knew that he was actually still in a relationship with his wife and that his wife thought they were together and all that. I don't think she knew that. I don't think she knew he was sneaking around like that. I think she really fell for the story that she cheated on me in 2015 and we've been separate ever since. And as soon as we dropped the kids off to college, we were going to get a divorce. I believe that Fonnie Willis really fell for that lie. The problem is you fell for a lie. Now you're in it. Now you look like the person that has been getting money from the county funneling it to your boyfriend and then he's been spending that money on you and vacations what do they say to criminals that are not on the law side on on the, on the criminal justice side ignorance is not an excuse just because you didn't know what he was doing is not an excuse that's what they tell us right that's 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 for sure what they tell us so let's 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 get back into what <laughs> What was going on in this thing? So remember, they said that this relationship between Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade didn't start until um, no, uh, what March or around springtime of 2022. They Ashley Merchant got Nathan Wade's cell phone geolocation data. I talked about it last week. They tracked, and I didn't realize this part. They were when they tracked his phone. They only tracked it before November 2021. But they only tracked his phone before the Trump case, because this whole thing was about them saying we weren't dealing with each other until after the Trump case was selected and he was this prosecutor already. Then we start dealing with each other. What they found out from January 1st to November 1st, which is before the Trump indictment, they had spoken on the phone 12, like either spoken on the phone or text each other 12,000 times. These are supposed to be people who are not dealing with each other. 12,000 texts and phone calls. Y'all know how many phone calls in that? That's 10 months right there. You understand? That's 10 months. Y'all been doing a lot of reaching out in 10 months. Okay. They also had the geolocation data from that same time period that shows Nathan Wade leaving his home around midnight and driving to Fonnie Willis's house or not even her house. Driving to Fonnie Willis's friend's condo and them meeting up, him staying there for a few hours. Like I said, they have cell phone data, so they're tracking the tower information. They triangulate and they know exactly where he's at. Him driving from his house down to Fonnie Willis's friend's apartment. They meet up, do whatever they do, and then go back at, they were saying like 4 a.m. in the, 4 in the morning. Then he would go back home, like to his house. The thing about that is, According to Fonnie Willis and her dad, Fonnie Willis only started using that apartment in Hapeville after the Donald Trump indictment because she started to get threats and people coming up to her, showing up to her house, threatening her and stuff like that. If the indictment didn't happen until November 1st, then why were you meeting this man at this apartment before that? So now I just bet. Let me backtrack on something that I just said. I just said I don't think that she knew he was creeping around. She did know. That's why she wasn't having that man come to her house. They had they had the friend Robin Bryant put an apartment in her name, and then they would use that apartment to meet up with each other. Fonnie Willis would go back to her house. Nathan Wade would go back to his house. So I scratch scratch what I said before that she didn't know. Either way, I think she's cooked now. But but. So for sure, they were using they were using this apartment to do their creep creep thing. Right. And it's I know if you listen, you probably looking at it like it sounds like I'm on the side of 
Trump in the defense. I'm really not I'm on neither side. I'm just saying, like, if you look at what's going on, it looks terrible for Fonnie Willis. It does not look good. It doesn't look like anything she's going to be able to get herself out of either. Because when you press people in certain positions, you need to make sure all of your ducks are in a row. You need to make sure that your slate is clean and your slate was clean until you started dealing with Nathan Wade. I'm really trying to figure out what made you deal with this man. And it's not to say I think he's a bad guy. I'm saying what made you deal with him? You, to me, should be a catch. You're a super successful lawyer. You just won an election. You should have your pick of the middle-aged men. By middle-aged men, I'm saying between 40 and 60 years old. You should really have your pick. You're a good-looking young lady. And I'm saying young lady being, you know, whatever. She's a little bit older than me. But I'm saying, like, good-looking young lady, successful, got your own money, got power in the city. You you could you could pick somebody. You know what I'm saying? You, you didn't have to go for the married man that was a lawyer that, and they trying to give him jobs and contracts and stuff. Like, you didn't have to do that. Now you really about to get, they about to jam you up. In this hearing with Ashley Merchant, they ask her, you, they ask Ashley Merchant pretty much like, what, what is, is this illegal? Like, what, what, what are we looking at here? Ashley Merchant said, yeah, this is, this is a felonies we talking about here. So what are the consequences for an attorney? to give sworn testimony that she did. If you're Bradley, what is it, Yerke? Uh, Yerte. Yerte, your track hawk data, your other independent verifications are found to be truthful. It's a crime, it, it's a felony. You'd lose your license. Yeah. It's perjury. Same for Wade. Yes. And we have, I mean, we have barred, we have rules that I are one of the, I mean, outside of privilege and confidentiality, we cannot suborn perjury. So if I, if I have a client who tells me I did it, I can't put them on the stand to say I didn't do it. Yeah. I mean, I, I would lose my license over that. I cannot do that. We're talking about felonies for a district attorney, all because she wanted to give her boyfriend a contract. Is it worth it? See, people look down on you know, trap queens, the girls who hold packs for their boyfriend, hold guns for their boyfriends, they look down on them and say, don't throw your life away for that man and all that type of stuff. This is the same thing to me. It's the same thing. This woman was willing to put her career on the line, her livelihood on the line, her, everything she worked for for the last 40 years on the line. I don't even know what she was getting out of it. She was the one dishing all the money to him. The money he was using to pay for their vacations was coming from her contracts. So I don't even know what she was getting out of it. What did she gain from what she's doing? A boyfriend? Somebody's husband? So you're not lonely now? Come on, man. It's not worth it. We got we to gotta, we gotta work smarter, not harder. Come on, man. Let me see what else what else was said in this thing here. So yeah, uh, pretty they they was asked uh, they asked her like what you know what kind of trouble can they get and they like yo these are felonies for sure and they could lose their licenses. So I really think this committee came together and they said um, because this committee is mostly Republican. So I'm looking at it like this. They, they, because you messed with Donald Trump in the state of Georgia, while Brian Kemp is the governor, and the, the, the Senate is mostly Republican, now you have to deal with the people who want to either be in the good graces of Donald Trump or already his friends. That's, you know, sometimes I feel like when you're in these positions and these positions of power and these positions to make decisions with authority, you really got to think about, is it worth it? You know what I'm saying? Is it worth it? Because let's think about what we're talking about here. This case was brought against Donald Trump because Donald Trump supposedly called somebody that was working at one of these county election offices and told them to find more votes. Now, while that is extremely egregious to say find more votes, 
is it worth you putting together this type of indictment against a, a billionaire with the resources to, you know, with these type of resources? It was that worth it, honestly. I don't, I don't, I don't. The trade off is not looking like, like it. You know, the trade off is not looking like. It. I'm not saying you're supposed to be scared of Trump. I'm saying if you're going to prosecute these people, don't give the contract to your boyfriend. <laughs> like, how hard was that? They, y'all, y'all realize they don't even have nothing else on Fonnie Willis. It's only this. They're not going way to her background saying she did something wrong a long time ago. Like, remember uh, Claudine, uh, what was her name? Claudine Gay up in Harvard where they say she was plagiarizing all that. They don't have anything like that when it comes to Fonnie Willis. Everything that they're saying she's done is in relation to this trial right here or this uh, case right here, the Trump case, saying that she was giving this man money and it was being used to benefit her. That's it. They don't have anything else on her. That means you played yourself, honestly. So all of that is going on. They they interviewed Ashley Merchant at the Senate hearing for two hours or it, it was probably two and a half hours or whatever, right? But it wasn't as much about the it wasn't as much about the disqualification. It was mostly about, yo, give us more information on what Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade have been doing. Right. Because, you know, in, in the hearing in the disqualification hearing, the judge kind of like cut off some of those questions and some of that information because he was like, yo, y'all doing pretty much y'all doing too much. Like, I get what you're trying to say. You don't have to keep on repeating it. You don't have to keep. It. So. They were they didn't let them get into everything. So this Senate hearing, maybe they were giving her the opportunity. Give us the rest of it. Like, tell us everything else. But then we get to close to the three hour mark. And a, and a young shark gets involved. And his name is Senator Harold Jones. He might be a legend at this point. So Harold Jones comes in, comes into play. Right. And he is completely focused on the disqualification hearing. He's not. So now Senator Harold Jones is the minority whip is what they call it. Pretty much the minority leader of the Senate. So he starts to question. He starts to question Ashley Merchant, and it's all about this disqualification thing. And he's telling her pretty much your disqualification brief and motion. Don't don't make sense. Honestly, he's putting her lawyer. He pretty much pulled her lawyer card. Right. So she like, oh, you put this motion together and you cite this case, Whitworth, the Whitworth case. Right. He kept they kept bringing up this Whitworth and he's going down it with it. And I quickly realized this man is a lawyer. He's not just some elected official that's just like listening and trying to follow along and all. He's a lawyer. Senator Hale Jones is a former attorney. So him questioning her whole different ballgame. What Harold Jones did is what those prosecutors in that argument should have done at the final argument. That's how you break down somebody's argument. That's how you show that they don't know what they're talking about. That's how you do what you're supposed to do. He, you, proper, he did what he's supposed to do, right? So he's telling Ashley Merch, this Whitworth thing, this, this talking about a conflict of interest, pretty much even in the case that you cited, and she cited this as her, pretty much her case law to back up her motion, it doesn't even agree with the outcome she's looking for. It's pretty much what um, Harold Jones is trying to say. He's like, and then Ashley Merchant is like, I don't, I don't remember what it says. Like, I need to read it. But he's saying this is the basis for your entire motion. Like, how, why don't you know what it even says? And it doesn't even say what you are alleging is happening in this case. You know, one is dealing with the outcome of the case. In this situation, you're saying that it's a conflict with the prosecution itself and they're gaining from prosecuting in in and of itself. And they're not actually worried about the outcome, which is what Whitworth, they're worried about outcome. They need a conviction or they need to, uh, they talked about forfeiture and needing to keep money or or, or whatever like that. So. Um, So the site is Whitworth. The court recognized a conflict of interest as a ground for disqualification. Um, held to arise where the prosecutor had acquired a personal interest or stake in the defendant's conviction. Um, and I, I don't, you know, I, I wish I had that case in front of me. I don't have the case in front of me. But essentially, to answer your question, the 
that first of all is f physical president only. So, right. Yes, and we. we but you did it. cite it. And and said right. that it's physical yeah. president only. And you're using that as the basis, really, to say it's a conflict. There's no other case law that you actually use in this particular brief to say it's a conflict other than Whitworth and also amusement sales, which deals with contingency fee. Right. And so in Whitworth, um, and I have the case if you want to go through it, it actually talks about that there's ways of citing the conflict. Right. Number one would be if he had or the prosecutor had actually spoken to the defendant. Had that, right. Has that taken place? No. Okay. Second, has he represented the defendant? No. So what you're saying is the actual conflict is just bringing it. No, the actual conflict is, oh, God, it's, that's a long answer. Um, the actual conflict is lying on your disclosures about how much money I'm talking as far as this issue is concerned right here. When you use with worth, you use amusement sales, and they say that there has to be an actual conflict. And amusement sales, and let's go back to Whitworth if we can, because in Whitworth, the person was actually told, the prosecutor was actually told by another prosecutor that they want the case to actually resolve in a conviction. Because what had happened was the defense attorney came to the prosecutor and said, we would like to plea. Mm -hmm. And the prosecutor basically said, no. He went and got advice from somebody, and that prosecutor said, we would like this case to resolve in a conviction. Right. And so the question, and that then was held not to be a conflict. They said that still is not an actual conflict, even though someone told that prosecutor, we want to see a conviction. We actually want to see it go to the end. Don't plea him out. And the court said, no, that's not an actual conflict because what you have to show is there's an actual unfairness to the defendant in the trial. Right. Can you point to any unfairness in the trial that's taking place? You know, and sorry to get too deep into the details, but uh, Harold Jones, Senator Harold Jones really, really, really pulled her card. He, he, he's like, yo, you cited this. And she was like, I don't know what it says. I just need to, I need to read it. So the fact that your main basis for your argument, you don't even rem remember what it says in there. It's almost like you didn't think there was a conflict of interest. You just needed a reason to expose Fonnie Willis. And that's pretty much what um, Senator Harold Jones was. He kept on saying is like because she she uh, Ashley Merchant kept on like trying to pivot off and go start talking about something else. And all oh, this impropriety. He's like, no, but let's just focus on this part here. You cited this case, and this case does not agree with anything you're saying about this scenario. It was ruled at the end that it wasn't even a conflict. And then she started bringing up other stuff. He's like, but bring it back. Bring it back. Let's stay focused on this right here. So pretty much Harold Jones' agenda was for sure to make it look like her case was invalid or her disqualification motion was invalid. And if that was his agenda, he for sure did what he had to do. But I think there's two different things here because he kept then he also started to bring up like, why are you saying Nathan Wade is, is not qualified and all that type of stuff? And he was part of the grand jury, the special grand jury. So he must know something. He must have been involved with something. He must be qualified. And so he didn't he didn't like that. He took exception to it. And honestly, you know what I'm saying? I, I'm trying to reach out to Senator Harold Jones to try to get me an interview with him. He followed me back, but he didn't read my message. I'm also saying that, excuse me, I'm also saying that I don't think he should have been selected either. That's, that's you know, I, if hopefully if you let me interview you, you can tell me why what I'm saying is wrong. And I know that as, uh, as black professionals, we're not supposed to say stuff like that, but my content is for black people. So it's not like I'm going in front of a bunch of white people saying that a black man should be selected. I'm saying there's other black people that were in that office that were qualified, more qualified. They should have been selected. So um, shout out to Harold Jones. He did the job that the prosecutor should have did um, two weeks ago or last Friday. He did their job for them. So we'll see, you know, but, but like I said, there's two issues here. The one issue is the disqualification here. The other issue is Fonnie Willis could be brought up on her own charges separately from all of this. And it could be based on this financial stuff that she's doing with this money. Because they're saying that even if you try to make all of these gifts and vacations and all that seem insignificant, the rule says, the law, the statute says, or the policy, whatever it is, says that any gift over $100 needs to be reported. And she didn't report. 
So it doesn't matter if you think it's insignificant. And because Harold Jones did go down and say, do you know what the average vacation, pretty much saying that they weren't taking lavish vacations. These were normal American vacations and they actually were cheaper than normal American vacation. It wasn't anything special. And, and they pretty much went back and forth about that for a while. And then Ashley Merchant was like, she, after arguing for a minute, then she was like, yeah, that's cool. But the standard is $100. So it really doesn't matter if it wasn't $10,000 versus $2,300. All of it is more than $100. So, and if that's the case, because I haven't looked up whatever rules she's talking about with this $100, but if that's the case, then she's right. I don't know what, you know, I don't know. I don't know how else to, you know, she's right if that's the case. If that $100 rule is the case, she's going to be correct there. I'm not going to take up any more of your time with that one because that is a long situation. That was a three-hour joint. That was a three-hour hearing, and I thought it was very interesting. I watched it all. I thought it was very interesting. Shout out to Senator Harold uh, Jones. You did what you could. They also, they also let it be known that because Ashley Merchant was pretty much saying that Nathan Wade added all of the, or, or Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade, they added, they put all these people in this indictment together because they wanted to be able to bill, they wanted to be able to get as much money for this case as possible. Pretty much, if they would have done these individual cases and done these small individual cases, they wouldn't have been able to have $35,000 months and stuff like that. It would have been small billing because it's just like one little small case, there's minimal evidence, stuff like that. These are mis, you know, could be a misdemeanor. So, and then Harold Jones is saying, you they offered you a plea deal and you told them no. You, you said no to the plea deal. So how can you say they're trying to expand this litigation when you're the one that denied the plea? They, you would have been finished. You wouldn't have had to do it, deal with this anymore. And they wouldn't have been billing for you. But you wanted to continue. And he sounded like you had a good point. And then her point, her counterpoint to that point was that no. Because we would not have been done. Because as part of that plea agreement, we still, all of my charges would have still been included in this overall RICO. So they still would have been using it. And they wanted me, and when I say me, they wanted Michael Roman to testify in the case against the rest of the defendants. So he would have still needed litigate, he would have still needed a legal attorney for this whole thing. And he wasn't out of it. He still had to testify. So that's why they turned it down. They didn't want to do that. So anyway, like I said, I'm done with it. I ain't going to keep talking. Y'all let me know what y'all think in the comments. You know, this is heavy. This is heavy stuff right here. Now we're going to move on to something else that's heavy because I want, this is, this is a crazy situation, man. So if you've been watching the regular podcast or the regular network for years, then you know that in 2021, I did a segment called Three Minutes with Kilo and I discussed the Divi. Divi is a home buying program for people who need help with getting a house and get on the path to home ownership, right? And I and, and not just I didn't just tell people about it. I warned everybody. I warned anybody who would listen. I said Divi is not good for the market. But now what I feel like is this is kind of similar to the subprime lending crisis that we had. You have buyers who have to use this program. Now they're already putting high cash offers on these houses. So now you're buying above market value. The reason I compare it to the subprime lending crisis because, is because you're putting people in a situation, basically enabling them to overpay for homes that they can't afford, really. They may be able to afford the original offer, but with the markups, they, they honestly can't afford that. And I believe this is a recipe for disaster. The bigger Divi gets, the more homes they'll buy, the more inflated the market will get, the less the inventory, and the more people are somewhat forced to even use Divi because if they want to win a bid on a home that they want to get, they pretty much need cash. Especially in Atlanta. And so many people, so many people who are helping people in financial situations and all that, they were telling people, use Divi. Divi is good. And I was like, if y'all see what Divi is doing and you really look into it, there is no way this is going to end good. This is impossible. It's no way. So I, I And I'll put a clip in here to show y'all what I was saying about Divi. So now it, it comes out. It has now come out. 
that, let me read this headline. Researchers find three companies own more than 19,000 houses in Metro Atlanta. Three, just between three companies, they own 19,000 rental properties in Metro Atlanta alone. Let's read some of this article. Three corporate landlords control nearly 11% of the single family homes available for rent in Metro Atlanta's core counties. Right now, this is from a study done by an analysis done by uh, Taylor Shelton, a geographer at Georgia State University. So shout out to him for do, for putting this together. Let's see what he found here. And he had a collaborator from from Rutgers University, Eric Seymour. So they did some hardcore investigation, too. So so they found that more than 19,000 homes were owned by just three companies in invitation homes, Pretium Partners or Pretium Partners, Amherst Holdings. The findings were published. OK, let's see here. OK, let me let me I'm scrolling through here because I'm trying to find the uh, potent information. So they say many large companies in the United States operate through smaller companies called LLCs. Okay. Now, now watch this about the LLC. Okay. So if a tenant was, uh, uh, is to sue, well, no. Okay. So they pretty much set up that the, the larger company set up all these little LLCs so that if you as a tenant said that something was wrong and you needed to sue, you would just sue one of these little small companies and you wouldn't even realize that they were connected to this huge, uh, company. Shelton said corporate landlords tend to have a lot of LLCs to protect themselves, a lot of LLCs to protect themselves. In the core metro Atlanta counties in this study, Fulton County, Clayton County, DeKalb County, Gwinnett County, and Cobb County, the three largest landlord companies, uh, largest landlord companies have more than 190 LLCs between them. That's absurd. Think about it. Three companies have 190, over 190 LLCs between them just to hide who they are so that you go do this whole transaction and all that, or you go become a renter here and you want to sue somebody or you want to complain to somebody or you want to call corporate, you're not going to know who to call. You're going to be calling a bunch of LLCs that's just probably, this is this is a business on paper, but they don't have any operations going on. They're just paperwork so that they can loop through the system and, and not be found. 190 LLCs between three companies. The LLCs usually have multiple addresses, making it difficult to trace the ties between their locations and their parent companies. To make things even more complex, many of these large companies are not publicly traded on the stock market, meaning their total number of holdings is not easily available to the public. Because Invitation Homes is publicly traded, the total number of properties uh, it owns is available to the public through the documents it files with the SEC. Okay. The other two we analyzed in this paper, Pretium Partners or Pretium Partners and Amherst, are backed by private equity and not publicly traded, so there is no way to ever know what full scope of their holdings are without a method like the one we use. So pretty much they're saying they were able to dig up and find um, how many how many things they own. So this is the cold part about it, right? Here we go. Now, they're just talking more about the fact that you're not going to be able to find um, find a company. This is particularly relevant for Atlanta, which is the largest market for this type of corporate for this kind of corporate landlord activity in the country, according to another study by Shelton and Seymour. You have to add up the next two or three largest markets in the U.S. together to have the same amount of corporate landlord investment as the, that Atlanta has. Let's think about that because there was a I found out about this because a real estate agent posted it on um, on Instagram, and then I, I commented on it and just let it be known. Of course, they doing this in Atlanta. Anywhere, anytime that you have this type of concentration of black money, black dollars. Corporations are going to come and find ways to exploit people. And that's not to say that they don't do this all over the world. It's to say that they do it especially egregiously in areas where black people are trying to be upwardly mobile and where black people are actually making something out of themselves and becoming something and making money. That's where they come up with the most of these schemes. How did they play us before in the last 15 years? They knew black people wanted to wanted to get some equity in their life. We wanted to get our net worth up. And guess what we went and, we went and did? We started to say, you know what? It's time for us to get in a home ownership game. 
So these banks and all these lenders across the country started saying, you know what? We're about to give some of the worst loans in the history of the world. That's what they do. And here we are here once again. Just think about it. Atlanta is not is, as far as the markets in, 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 in the country. Atlanta is not the biggest city. It's not the biggest metro area. It's not the most populated. There's multiple cities. There's there's multiple cities in California alone that got more more people than Atlanta do. So for them to say you can add you have to add up the next two or three largest markets in the United States to together to have the same amount of corporate landlord investment that Atlanta has. That's sick. New York has 10 million people. Atlanta has like 500,000. No, well, if you look at the total total Atlanta metro, Atlanta's like four million. But New York City, million, many million. L.A., many million. Well, no, Atlanta's around a million. Um, L.A., like three million. Last time I checked, I'm saying I, I don't know what it is now. Chicago, like two million. New York, like I said, ten million. Like you, I don't know how many in the Bay, but you're talking about Atlanta being the largest market for something like this and they're not the largest in anything else there's no other metric on any list where atlanta is number one as it relates to real estate it's not the cheapest place there's not the most available homes here there's not the most people here it's not the most anything that would lead companies to say let's go buy up everything down down there there's there's it this city don't lead in nothing as far as real estate indicators to say that's the investment spot. Only thing they lead in, only thing we lead in is available black disposable income. That's it. We don't lead in nothing else. All right. Let's be real about this, man. This is race related. Like I said, I keep a I keep a race card on me. The race card is on me, it's always nearby. This is race related. The reason why I told people that Divi was bad, I'm going to tell you about my situation. The reason I told people that Divi was bad back then, right, is because I found out that, okay, so Divi is a home buying program. Normally, and for the dirt, for, for a long time, home buying programs were normally for people who could not get a loan through conventional means, meaning I couldn't, I, my credit is either not good enough or I don't have enough money for a down payment. So I need to go find alternative methods that'll let me become like a, either a rent to own type of person or some type of other alternative route to home ownership. That's what Divi was created for originally. What I noticed was happening in 2021, though. Is that Divi was now being used by people who weren't having any financial issues, who didn't have any credit issues. They were using Divi because Divi is making cash offers for properties. And it's just allowing people who who just want to who want to compete with investors in the market or compete with a lot of people that had a lot of dollars in 2021. It was allowing them to now compete just using Divi's money. So, you know, if, if y'all remember in previous eras of real estate, if an investor came to you and offered you cash, they were most of the time going to offer you a lot less money than what you can get on the open market. Right. And and I, I got my house, um, my last house in 2017 for 100,000. Right. Because everything was cheaper back then. I got my house in 2017 for 100,000. In like 2019, I got hit up by an investor. I still and my interest rate was uh, f- I, like 5.25 or whatever like that. Um, so in 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 two years, I had only paid down like three thousand dollars in principle. Right. If y'all know what that means, we could talk about that later. But in principle, only hit, paid down like three thousand dollars in two years, right? So, but this investor hit me up like, "Yo, I want to buy your house seventy thousand. and I'm like, "No, but I owe ninety. I owed like ninety six thousand dollars on this joint. I can't give it to you for seventy. And like, that's the I could come up to seventy five. Like, that's the best I can do. I wasn't even looking to sell my house. They just hit me up telling me, like, pretty much trying to put the pressure on. Like, yo, all I could do is seventy five. Like, well, really, know what he said was. 67 at first then he was like, i could do 72 like that's the most i can do and i'm just i'm like no why would i sell my house for that that don't even make sense i'm gonna i'm gonna sell you my house then i'm gonna owe another twenty thousand dollars that just don't make sense but what i'm trying to say is that's how investors used to operate investors never paid top dollar divvy came in as an investor they were backing these loans up they were they were doing closing in two weeks investor stuff i knew this was fishy 
They was closing in two weeks. And this is the biggest red flag right here. Divi was allowing buyers, the buyers that were in their program, to go way over asking price. We're not even just talking about appraised price. We're not talking about nothing. They was going way over asking price. No time in the history of ever in real estate investing has investors been okay paying more than what the what the seller is asking for. That right there was the biggest red flag to me, and I didn't need to see nothing else. Just forget the fact that this was happening all over Atlanta. I knew it was happening, but it was happening all over Atlanta, right? So it was throwing, it was making prices go up super high. It was making them go up super high because not only do you have, there's a lot of money in Atlanta, like just people with bread. Not only do you have regular people that have jobs that have a lot of money to bid, they can, you know what I'm saying? I could, I could bid up with you. You have a lot of that. You have a lot of investors in this city, right? And then you have these institutional situations like Divi. Divi was letting people go. So I put my house on the market. So remember I told you I got it for 100000 in in 2017. In 2020, I wanted to sell my house. I wanted to move to somewhere bigger. I put my house on the market for 140000 Now, in 2020, this was before anything went crazy. People were not buying houses for over asking price at that time, 2020. In 2020, Somebody would come, yo, I'll give you like I'll give you 135, like I need closing costs. It was still like that type of thing. They still want you to cover closing costs and they're not giving you asking price. That was still going on. So I end up having to drop my sale price to uh, my, my asking price to like 135. And I was offering allowance for like new flooring and all that. Like this is how it was tougher to sell a house at that time. It was a buyer's market. Eventually, like we got we had under contract four times. People kept pulling out because there was so much options. There was so much inventory available, so much good options, too, that people just every time they would just get something under contract, then they would see something else that they like better and they would just let it go. They say, all right, I'm out and go get another house. But they so uh, the lady the day before closed and she pulled out. I guess she had cold feet. She pulled out. So after that, I was annoyed. I just took my house off the market. I said, I'm done with this. Then 2021 comes around. 2021 is a completely different world now. Now people are back spending money as the pandemic is, stuff is open again, especially in Atlanta, stuff is open again, fully. I put my house on the market. I, I did change my, I changed my flooring by myself. I changed the bathrooms, uh, one of the bathrooms in the house, but I didn't spend that much money. I put the house back on the market for 185 this time, Right. I put it on the market for 185. I had an open house that day. I got four offers that same day. All of them was above asking. The one that I chose was from a Divi buyer. They offered 200,000 on a house that I had listed for 185. So they used Divi to go $15,000 above asking so that they can beat everybody else out on a house that they could see because you could see records of, of, of MLS records and all that. They could see that I just listed it a year ago for 135. Right? They didn't care. Divi is cutting the check. Divi, they were cutting the check. So they allowed they allowed this investment company and then they closed in two weeks. They bypassed a lot of the due diligence stuff. That was another thing. Divi, this is another thing that that was the red flag to me. Divi was bypassing some of the due diligence stuff that's normally happening when you are in these home buying programs. You feel me? It's it's it it was it was a red flag from the. I didn't even need to see nothing else. I knew what happened in the situation with that buyer. So I seen that. But then I started I knew what was going on out in the market, too, because I was trying to get my own house. I was trying to get me another house. And I know that I was being outbid by people. And I'm like. These people are going so far above asking prices, not making no sense. I told y'all before on here to get this house I'm in right now. I went forty thousand dollars above asking price. Think about that. I didn't have no invest. It was me, my month. So I went forty thousand on top of a fixer upper. That's what Divi was doing to this market in Atlanta. And now we are at the now this the this is why now let me tie it back to the situation with the 19,000 houses. Uh when Divi was doing that, it was a rent to own situation, meaning 
Divi is actually the one that owned all those houses. I When I did my video back in 2021, I was showing people how once you do this rent to own thing from Divi, it doesn't, the house doesn't just automatically go to you. You have to then buy the house from Divi if you want to buy the house or you can just walk away. But you have to then buy the house from Divi, right? When Divi sells you the house, they mark it up crazy. So you're not, you're not even getting the same, you're not getting the price that you just negotiated. So I, the reason I was calling it bad is because you already inflated the price when you use Divi's money to overbid on this house to get it. So since you overbid on it, Divi was fine. They let you pay $200,000 for a $180,000 house. Now they're going to mark it up some more. And they're not hiding that they're marking it up. You can go on their website and see the numbers, which I showed also. So you pay two hundred dollars for this house that's only that was only asking for one eighty five. dollars You pay two hundred. dollars Divi lets you because Divi knows in the next 18 months you're about to want to buy this house. You're going to have to pay two twenty five dollars to get it from Divi now. That's why Atlanta's market is the way it is right now. Because programs like that. <clears throat> I blame specifically Divi for this. And just think about this. If you didn't buy that house from Divi, y'all thought, what y'all think? Divi just kept, kept all the houses? No. They sold them to these companies like this. Im- imitation homes and all this uh, invitation, whatever it's called. That's what they do. They, they're going to sell them in packages just like other, just like mortgage companies sell loan, sell uh, mortgages off to other companies. The same thing. That's how these companies like this are able to get large portfolios. You think they're going sitting around buying all these houses up individually? No, that's not what's happening. So I, it, it, this is this is something that I need to talk about because this is something people need to understand. When you are buying a house, right? And I'm, I'm going to tell a couple stories about my own, my situation and stuff I've been through. When, when you're buying a house, you have to understand that, you first of all, you got to understand budget. Your budget should not, I'm, my advice, just my advice, I'm not a real estate professional. I'm just a person that studied a lot of different scenarios in this thing, right? <laughs> budget, your budget should not be the loan amount that you got approved for. That that should not be your budget. Your budget should be far lower than that. If somebody, if they approve you for 200000 go shopping for houses that cost one fifty. Like, do not max, don't ever max out your freaking loan value. That's for, because, that, just don't do that, okay? Now, <clears throat> let me look at my little list because I have some stuff that I need to tell y'all. Let me tell you about my first time trying to buy a house. 2000, um, 2010, I hired a realtor in Virginia, right? I hired a realtor in Virginia. Um, I got approved. Like Now, this is 2000. Like I said, 2010. Everything was like dirt cheap at that time because this is coming off of the subprime lending thing. This is coming off the predatory loans stuff. So everything was super cheap in Virginia right then. So I'm I, they approved me for 100000 right? But I'm telling the lady, I'm like, I don't want to spend that. I'm telling the realtor. I hired a realtor lady. I think it was Keller Williams. So I'm like, um, I want to spend like 50. So I show her houses that I had seen on realtor.com. I'm like, I want to go look at these houses. It was like 30,000, 40,000. Like it wasn't nothing really at 50,000. I just said, I don't want to spend more than 50. I was really looking way lower than 50. But so I'm, I'm showing them like, yo, let's go look at these houses. Well, we go look at a couple. And then, but she keep on sending me houses that cost like $100,000 though. So I'm like, I'm like, I ain't feeling it. So now this is me as an inexperienced person. I didn't really know what options I had, right? Because I felt like I was stuck. I asked the lady herself. I asked her, how can I get out of this agreement with us? Like, I don't even want to buy a house no more. I told her that straight up. I said, how can I get out of this? I don't want to do this. Because, you know, when you get somebody to represent you in real estate, you sign a contract with them. So. I, I was like, how how can you like how can I end this? I don't want to do this no more. And she just straight up told me, like, uh, I can send you the paperwork. We could fit, we can pretty much I fired her. And I fired her as an inexperienced person. I didn't even know you could fire a real estate agent. But that's something I need y'all to know that you can do. You can fire them if they're not doing if they showing you stuff that you that you don't want, or you told them what you want and they keep showing you other stuff, you can fire them. Tell them you don't you don't have to be like you fired. You just say, hey, I want to I want to terminate this agreement. It's not working out. But the lady told me, like, yeah, you can sign this thing and like, uh, you know, we uh, will end this 
partnership, whatever. So, boom, fired her. And I went over to Prudential. And I was, that, that first one was a white lady. I went over Prudential. And then I got with this older, middle-aged black man. And, I, and the first house that we went to was the house that I told y'all about before that I got for $63,000 in a bidding war. I went $4,000 over asking. So he that was the first house we went to. It was perfect for me. He got, you know, he got it. And then at the closing table, I got money back. So now that's the, for me to tell y'all that you can fire a, a, a real estate agent if they're not doing with you. And you don't have to waste no months with them or no no long time. If you could tell that your vibe is not meshing with them at all, don't even waste your time or their time anymore. Just tell them, thank you for what you've done, but I don't want to do this no more. It's not it's not working, right? And it and it and you don't even have to have a good reason. You don't have to have a reason that, that seems good to them. For any reason that you don't want to work with them anymore, you can let them go, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, I would, another thing I want us as buyers to not do, to get out of the mindset of buying a house is not a dream type of thing. It's not a perfect type of thing. It's not so, unless you're a rich person and you have all the options that you, you, you can do anything in the world that you want to do. If you're a regular working class citizen, get dream home out of your mind. And I'm sorry I had to say it like that for the people that never bought a house. Get dream house. Get it out of your mind. Don't you see a lot of people think about buying a house from top down, meaning like, let me make a let me make my list of things that I that like my whole. Well, let me just do this whole list of things that I want in the house. What you really should be doing when you're buying a house. Minimum requirements. It's like a job. You should be doing minimum requirements. If you need three bedrooms and two baths and you want a yard that that should be the make or break for you. The make or break shouldn't be. I walked in the house, man, they got green carpet up in here, man. I don't want to like green carpet. That's a lot to deal with that. Don't do that. That don't like get dream house out of your head. Remove it. And the reason I'm saying what I'm saying right now is because I need us to understand how important still Home ownership is. And I need us to understand still why so many people are not owning, even though they can probably afford to own. It's mostly because they have they they in their head about some dream house. That that's a lot of people are in their head about a dream house. And I'm telling you, there's there's millions and millions and millions of millionaires in this country. It's because of the home they own. It's because of the equity in the house that they own. These are not people with a bunch of businesses and nothing like that. They work a regular job and they have a house that's worth something. That's it. That's why home owner, the, the sooner you get in, the sooner you be on the path to increasing your value as a, as a citizen or your monetary value as a citizen, your net worth, right? Get dream house out of your mind. Put your minimum requirements down. Tell your realtor your minimum requirements and I'm not saying that you need to just go out and just give fix a upper and all that. I'm saying that for the most part, you're not finding a perfect house. Unless you build it yourself, you're not finding a perfect house. And that's not even a problem. Like most of the time when you get a house, even if it's brand new and you designed it, you probably going to change something in there. So. Get that, get that dream house thing out there. Minimum requirements. I need, I need backyard for because I got a dog. I need, I got two kids, so I need three bedrooms, and I need a ma- so I need two guest bedrooms, and I need one master or primary suite, whatever you want to call it. And I need two bathrooms. I need a one bathroom in our master, and I need a bathroom in the hallway for the kids. Like that's the type of, you know what I'm saying? You don't say I'm looking for a house with an island. Islands are cool. Like, I like islands. But to go shopping and make a, a a deal breaker be this house doesn't have an island and you're not rich, you're setting yourself up to not find a house at all. And that's not to say islands are hard to find. I'm just giving you an example of something that something that small should not be in the way, it should not be an obstacle to you becoming a homeowner is what I'm trying to say. It shouldn't be 
Man, this deck is not big enough. No. I'm I'm sorry to say it like this. No. Get that out your head, man. I think that it's so vital right now for people to own homes that we really can't play. As soon as soon as it started to become like black people are buying houses in large numbers and we are trying to close this gap in home ownership rates. Now you got all this corporate foolishness coming to the blackest city with the most money, the most the, the, the highest black dollar value. They coming down here buying up everything so we can't buy them. Why do y'all think that is? Because it was starting to become in style for us to buy houses. Which, like I said last week, I don't just want stuff to be in style. I want it to be regular for us. However, home buying, I wouldn't I wasn't mad at that trend. Because that's actually something that you're going to deal with long term. So even when it's not cool no more, you still will have had the house that you bought in that time when it was trendy. You feel what I'm saying? So. The the uh, man, listen, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that in the era of black people and preaching financial literacy and home ownership, I don't think it's a coincidence that these companies came to the blackest city in the country, the, the, the blackest wealthy city in the country and start buying up everything. I don't think that's an accident. Sorry. Never going to think it's an accident. I think it's deliberate. Right. Minimum requirements, my people. Things that you heard your friends do five to 10 years ago, that's not possible anymore in 2024. You have to deal with three companies that own 19,000 single family homes. It's a whole different ballgame. Remember, I did the segment a couple months ago about the senators out west trying to ban institutional investors from owning more than 100 properties. This is the reason they were trying to do that. And I was telling y'all how good of an initiative that was. Right? What else are we looking at here? Okay. Now, when you when you buy a home, and the reason I, why I said you never, 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 your budget should never be at the top of your loan approval. When you get a house, the mortgage amount that you start out paying on day one will undoubtedly not be the same in a year or two. It's not even a question. Your insurance is going to go up. If nothing else goes up, I guarantee your insurance is going up. Insurance is one of those things that they make, they kind of make changes and they can make changes every single time you renew. Right? It's not like other things. It's like insurance, they change often. Insurance goes up. Like my insurance went up a lot. I think my first year, See, because what they do is they try to rope you in with that first because they could tell they know it's a brand new house because, you know, when they interview you about, hey, what do you need? What type of quote you need? You tell them, hey, I'm buying a new house and I need a quote for this. So they rope you in with that first price. That first price will never be the second price. When you go to renew it the next year, it's never going to be that. When I got this house, the first quote they gave me was like twelve hundred dollars. Like twelve hundred. Same exact house. Twelve hundred dollars. For insurance, I'm saying for the whole year. Right now, it's $2,300. $2, and I shopped around for that. That's the cheaper one now. $2,300. And it was $1,200 my first year in this house. That's what's going to happen. So you cannot, you can't, it's paramount. You cannot buy a house at the max budget of your loan. I mean, at the max loan amount that they approved you for can't do it. This is from me to you. You can't do that. Come way down. Also, repairs happen. I know people that have brand new houses that things happened in the brand new house that they had to fix like shortly after they moved in. You have to plan for that type of stuff. You can do the warranty stuff. You can do all that. But sometimes something needs to be fixed urgently and immediately. You don't want to be house poor where you can't afford to do anything inside your house because all your money is going to your mortgage. So you have to come down from that freaking max loan amount. You just can't do it. Let me tell you another one of my situations. Again, I got the crib. 
the county that I'm in did a new tax assessment, right? Because the pandemic houses changed value so much. So uh, counties, they don't they do not do assessments like yearly or nothing like that. They do them when they feel like there's a significant change in the values of the cribs around their houses. I said cribs, but in the homes, right? So my area did a new assessment last year, right? My taxes increased year over year, $2,000. So while... It was already high, which I consider to be high. It was already $4,000 a month. I mean, $4,000 a year for tax. I'm talking about just taxes. $4,000 a year for taxes. It's now like $6,200, something like that. Now, if you do the math, that's like $500 a month in just taxes alone. That's something that you got to be ready for when it's when, when you buying. At buying time, you got to assume... You got to assume that you made a smart decision that you bought a house that's going to increase in value. That's what I did. I bought a house that I knew would increase in value. Right? Because I feel, I think I'm good at choosing houses. I bought a house I knew would increase in value. I bought a house that I knew was going to give me some equity. So I had to know that tax increases was going to come with that. That's how they gentrify people. When they increase them taxes because the values is up and then you can no longer afford it because you done maxed out your budget on buying a house. Now you can't even afford it no more. That's they, they, they get people up out of there. But that's why I like this where I live at now. This is the black people that they can't gentrify. Because I live in Fulton County. Taxes are high as hell. See what I'm saying? I'm not saying that black people everywhere in Fulton County. I'm saying the part of Atlanta that I live in these black people have been living over here, mansions and all that, since f- f- since all these houses have been built in the 90s. They've been here the whole time. You see what I'm saying? So uh, my, my taxes increased last year by $2,000, and it was already high. So now I'm paying $500 a month in taxes alone, right? That's something that you got to account for when it's time to buy a house. You got to make sure you do not go to the max budget of your loan. Come way down. I'm telling you, all this stuff is going to come up. Your insurance is going to go up and your taxes will change if you chose the right house. I know a lot of times we say like we want lower taxes. You do want lower taxes, but you also want your taxes to reflect the value of your home. If 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 you're paying three seven hundred dollars a year in taxes, that means your house ain't worth nothing. You don't want a house that's not worth anything. You want a house that's worth a lot. The more your house is worth because you chose properly, the more you have to pay in taxes. That's just how it's going to go. You see what I'm saying? And um, now, some stuff that you can do is choose different areas. That's how you get around, you know, that's how you kind of mitigate some of these price issues. So let's just say your preferred area. Is, I know some people make choices based on schools. You know, that's a big one. But let's say your preferred area is Fulton County. But you know that the taxes are high. You know that that's going to cost you about $400 a month in taxes, right? Maybe maybe you go a little bit further out west and you go to Douglasville. It is outside of Fulton County. But let's say you go to Douglasville. Now your tax is only 200 a month. You know what I'm saying? Your tax is $2,400 a year instead of $4,500 a year. Right? I don't know if y'all, re- like, I'm sure a lot of y'all realize it, but even just $200 a month in mortgage, that's that's significant. That's a whole nother bill that you can cover with that. Because when you when you come to areas that cost more money, that's a, it, that taxes is something that's just never going away. You can't pay that off. It's always going to be there every year. You got to pay it. You see what I'm saying? So, you know, that's how that's how you can kind of help with like so you can get let's say if you got a four hundred thousand dollar budget, you spend four hundred thousand in Fulton County. It's not going as far as if you spend four hundred thousand in Douglasville and cheaper taxes. So you probably get a bigger house. Right. Not probably you for sure get a bigger house. Probably newer house, all that. So that's how you kind of that's how you kind of get around this type of stuff. If uh, we got probably some people that out that that watch, that listen from uh, my hometown, Youngstown. So if you if you've been approved for one hundred and twenty five thousand, and you say, 
you know, I'm going to get not 125,000. Let's say you got to prove a 200, right? 200,000. And you're like, no, nah, I just want to live in, I want to live in Canfield. But when you start searching for houses, you're going to see that Canfield's houses cost a lot more money than that. A lot of the ones that you would want probably. So now you might have to make a decision like, maybe I can deal with, maybe I can deal with Hubbard. Maybe. Them are the type of compromises you got to make to secure your financial future. You know what I'm saying? I know that's a completely different world. Like, if you want to live in Canfield, you definitely don't want to live in Hubbard. But if you want to own a home, those are the type of decisions that you're going to have to make. You have to say, if I'm in Atlanta, all right, I'm I'm because me at first, I was looking in Decatur. I was looking in Decatur, Georgia, because I just I like the east side. Decatur is, you know what I'm saying? That's where I had we we was living for a minute. I was living, I was looking over there, but it just their taxes was high, the home prices was high, like they gentrified crazy over there. And a lot of the houses was old. You see what I'm saying? They didn't, you know. So I had to I had to search far and wide. To, I'm all the way on the west side now. I'm I'm about as far from Decatur as Canfield is from Hubbard. That's the type of compromise that you got to make when you when you when you are when choosing the right home is the priority. Right? Not choosing a dream house, choosing the right house. To me the right house is the house that I can get in, I can live in and it's going to increase in value to give me equity. That's the right house to me. Right? So I, I just need I just need everybody who's, you know, far and wide, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're Latino, whether you're Asian, whether you're Native American, whether you're Indian, whether you are whatever you are. If you're buying a house in America. Pay attention to what I'm telling you. Do not max out that budget. No more dream house talk. Not in 2024. That's out. No more dream house. Minimum requirements. That's it. And you build from there. So everything above that is above and beyond and you're happy. Minimum requirements. That's the word of the day. That's the term of the day. Minimum requirements. Okay. I got one more topic for y'all. I'm, I'm very tired. However, I am going to because this person is is is, is significant. And I did want to, I want to show him some love. There is a man who has just been inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Y'all know I shout out the inventors, the engineers. I got to shout him out. His name is Lanny Smoot. He's a black man. and He actually works for Disney right now. He works for Disney right now as one of their super engineers. And he's inventing a bunch of stuff over at Disney. He invented like this crazy floor that you can get on, I guess, when you're doing like augmented reality and virtual reality games and stuff. It's like you can walk on it, but you're not really moving forward or anything like that. You like walking on the floor that's like rollers, but it's not. I don't know. It's crazy. I don't even know how he came up with anything like that. But let me just read a little bit about my man's background because he is the top inventor for Disney right now, but he didn't get his start at Disney. So let's read about him. Here we go. Let me read his background. Born December 13th, 1955, Smoot became fascinated with the process of invention early on while growing up in Brooklyn, New York City. Well, Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn is the borough in New York City and New York State. Okay. When his father brought home a battery, light bulb, and electric bell and wired them up. Let me let me read that properly. When his father brought home a, a battery, light bulb, and electric bell and wired them up so the bell would ring and the light bulb would light, Smoot was fascinated and inspired to learn all that he could about electricity, electronics, science, and ultimately engineering. Uh he said, I think that's what's most important about me is I'm continuously curious. I'm really interested in technology, but always wondering what I can do that is new that no one else has done before, that no one else has done. This is important right here. Smoot's parents encouraged him to follow his continuous curiosity, instilling in him a confidence to explore and experiment as well as desire to contribute to the world. See, that's important. You got to encourage somebody to be inquisitive. You see what I'm saying? Me as a kid and still as an adult, I ask a million questions. But I got told as a young kid, stop. I got told to mind my business a lot. 
Like none of your business and mind your business, all that type of stuff. My daughter, my, my four-year-old, she asks a million questions like me. And I try to make sure, I try to answer all of them. But she 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 has an unlimited supply of questions though, trust me. And I don't I don't discourage her from doing that because that's how I learn. I learn like that. Um, so here we go. My path was paved by people who believed in me. See, there you go. I was an inventor, albeit a tiny one, when I was young and in some ways doing a smaller version of what I'm doing now. I just have a more sophistic I just have more sophisticated tools and a much larger technology canvas available to me, but I'm the same creative kid inside. Creativity is very important, man. That's why I called my my, uh, business back in the day, Righteous Creativity. Okay. While attending Brooklyn Technical High School, Smoot was named a Bell Labs Engineering Scholar, earning a full scholarship to Columbia University summer work at Bell Labs. Oh, he earned the summer work at Bell Labs and a guaranteed full-time work with the company after he graduated. So his, 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 his engineering prowess made him become a Bell Labs Scholar. Which was big. Y'all remember Bell was humongous back in the day. Bell was so big that they was deemed a monopoly and they broke him up. So that lets you know what Bell was on. Bell found him and said, yo, boy, you are worth investment. And then he went to an Ivy League school, Columbia. Big dog, big dog. He earned his bachelor and master's in electrical engineering and he began his career with Bell Labs in 1978. While at Bell, Smoot invented some of the first fiber optic transmission technologies to be widely used in the Bell telephone system. Now, you got to remember, Bell broken up, and I'm pretty sure, if I'm not mistaken, part of when Bell was broken up, AT&T got created. And if y'all know, AT&T is using fiber now. So this man was invented some of the first fiber optic transmission technologies to be widely used by Bell telephone system. So he was way ahead of his time. Okay. Later, he moved to Bell Core, which was founded following the breakup of Bell Systems. There, he invented the first high-quality, large-screen video teleconferencing system called Video Window, which ultimately was showcased at the Smithsonian Institute's Information Age exhibit. Think about that. Now, if you don't know what video teleconference is, pretty much he invented FaceTime. <laughs> okay. First high-quality, large-screen video teleconferencing system, the Video Window. That's FaceTime. So, or, or or if you could say Teams calls like Skype, stuff like that, that's where it comes from, his ideas. And then um, he invented more and more and more stuff that got the attention of Disney and Disney brought him in in 1998. The rest is history because he went on to become Disney's greatest inventor, pretty much. If not the greatest inventor, he's for sure their best inventor right now. He's, he's the best. He's the top guy at Disney right now. So... I want y'all to go look up Lanny Smoot. He's a black man. Uh, he is playing no games. His mom and dad believed in him. They encouraged him to be inquisitive and be continuously curious, never stop asking questions, never stop learning. And he went on to be one of the greatest inventors this country has ever known, as many black people are. And and so many people are like, oh, black people, we don't create nothing. We don't do it. Yes, we do. There's plenty of black creators. that th- There's always been plenty of black inventors. So y'all don't, y'all don't, you need to go look these people up. That's the thing about it. You need to look these people up because how many black inventions have been stolen? You know how many patents would and, and, and royalties would belong to the black community had they not been stolen in the, in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century? Shout out to everybody now that's able to, you know, access the USPTO now, the, the, the United States Patent and Trademark Office now, because they're not being, our stuff is not being stolen like it was back in the day. Shout out to Lanny Smoot. You understand? And um, I'm actually going to get up out of here. On, oh, excuse me. I'm actually going to get up out of here on that one. Even I do still have some stuff on my Oh, matter of fact, let me. I do. Never mind. I do still have some stuff on my list. But uh, I'll get to that another time. Because I feel like I've been going for a while. The power was doing some weird stuff. So I cut the video and had to jump back in. So that's all I got, man. I appreciate y'all for sticking with me, rocking with me. I know I went very long on that um, Ashley Merchant and Fonnie Willis thing, but that's a very important topic right now. I'm in this county, so it matters. So appreciate y'all for rocking with me, man. Make sure you like this video. Make sure you comment your thoughts below. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you do everything else that I said to do at the beginning of the video. Peace.